Welcome back to Basic Bananas Radio, where we share tried and tested ways to grow your brand and get more customers. Everything from the latest in marketing and branding, right through to growing your team and creating an irresistible culture. Hi there, and welcome back to Basic Bananas Radio. Today, I have another special guest for you. We've got Cesar Aldea joining us. And Cesar is an impact entrepreneur and a speaker, and he's also a husband, father, a volunteer firefighter, and he's just an amazing human. He's also the co-founder of Paddle Across the Bay, something we will talk about in our interview here. And I can't wait to share this chat with you because we're discussing so many gold nuggets and one in particular about the fear of failure and how to embrace failure. So let's dive straight in. Hey, Cesar, thank you so much for joining me on Basic Bananas Radio today. Thank you for the invitation. Very excited. Yeah, me too. We met a few weeks ago through Entrepreneurship Organization, Entrepreneurs Organization, we're both members of, and we got talking because you're very much someone who loves using business to make a positive impact and to leverage your strengths to make a positive impact in the world, something that I'm passionate about too and so we had a collaboration between ocean lovers and paddle across the bay which is an event that you just ran on saturday and you raised close to eighty thousand australian dollars for lifeline can you just let's start with that how how did that come about and what an amazing event i saw the footage you were on tv and it, it looked incredible thank you yes and, and also again i wanted to publicly thank you francisca on behalf of us paddle across the bay for Ocean lovers being part of, I guess, the this 2024 campaign. So, Paddle Across the Bay and, and yourself, as, as I know, you like kite surfing. Everything started back in 2013 after my mother passed away to cancer. And Richard Branson had just crossed the English Channel, establishing a new World Guinness record. I was very... Um, frustrated, heartbroken, and I wanted to do something about it. So I, I thought I'm going to challenge Richard Branson. I'm just going to challenge the, the, the richest uh, guy in the world to do the same thing as a, an everyday citizen. And I decided to cross Port Phillip Bay. And like that, uh, I had 25 people that joined me. And we went from that, raising 10 grand, to then many years later to 150 people that that year with all of us in the middle of the bay, the wind died. So soon after that, we were sitting in a government office with people in suits and tape recorders in the middle of the table. And myself and my co-founder, Kyle Wakeham, we didn't know at that time if we were going home or if we were going somewhere else uh, in, that, in that conversation. So we decided that it was time for us to find a different vehicle to achieve the same vision of raising funds and awareness for a worthy cause. And so we look at paddle, standard paddling, as a much more accessible uh, water sport that we know we could effectively get someone from zero to hero and with no experience, as long as you knew how to swim, to get them on the water and be part of the event. And like that, we went from 100 people to 500 people in 2020. Then since the pandemic, a couple of year break, we went back to uh, resume with uh, having Anaconda now on board, helping us to resume that momentum. And all in all, 10 years later, we've raised a little above a million bucks. And that, yes, as you said, it just happened last weekend. So we're super excited. Now we're raising money for mental health through Lifeline Australia. So yeah, that's uh, that's what, one of the things I do. Incredible. Does Richard Branson know about your effort? Uh, I, uh, I I did back in the days between 2013 and 15. Uh, I was anyway anything that was Richard Branson Virgin uh, Virgin Australia or any other Virgin brand. I would just be one of those people commenting and 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 trying to you know cause a little bit of niggle and see if someone would get that attention. But uh, no, so far I don't think so. But but I keep telling the story, so one day we'll we'll get to to him. Hopefully, when he's still you know he's still alive. And he's looking very yeah. healthy, so it looks like he's going to have a few more years to go. Oh, totally. Uh, uh, he actually, he's, he's the one that wrote the foreword for one of my books. 
and I and I had mm. to actually to to get him to say yes. I knew I had to go to his island and and talk to him because I knew that otherwise he he won't respond. And I feel like there could be a bit of a race because he's he's very obviously he's very entrepreneurial and he's he's mm. he likes a bit of a competition. So I feel like maybe there there could be a race in the future between him and five hundred people. <laughs> Yeah, uh, and, and that's one of those things that I, I think that the story, as I tell it, usually it, it was you know the, the the way to challenge Richard Branson as the richest man in the world, but also challenging cancer uh, and wanting to you know contribute to ending cancer. So big bold goals, and usually you know committing to something big and with very little chance of succeeding, and um, and figuring out the why and how in the process. So, yeah, love that. So today, I'd like to discuss two things with you. And one is is what we are started to discuss right now already is how can we use our businesses for purpose? So how can we be more purposeful in our businesses? And I know for our members here, even at Basic Bananas, a lot of people want to do good. They want to make a positive impact, but maybe they sometimes don't know where to start they can't organize you know a big event like like you do or they just don't have the means to do something big what is your what are your thoughts on that where where can a business a smaller business get started in being purposeful um i find that perhaps i, I go back into and i it's a question that i have reflected on uh, Back in the days, and first of all, I've been in Australia for now 17 years. Uh, I arrived uh, from Chile, South America, back in 2007. And looking back, I was a complete, uh, what's the word? I had not fear of failure. That was the one thing. Over the years in a society that I find it a little more conservative, we look at risk in a very different way. And perhaps... Having that ingenuity and no fear of failing is is something that I find is is been a great um, fuel for me over the years to to attempt things that often don't work. Um, I think, and I love this culture. I love this society. I'm part of it. Uh, but the one thing that I probably feel we should be better at is to push people to take risks and in a society that is quite conservative. And I love to think that like you and I, we both grew up in the eighties where life happened in the outdoors. We saw risks very different, you know, uh, people with broken arms and broken legs. It was, it was cool. Um, now that's a tragedy and we look at things very differently. So I, I, I think starting with, uh, looking at risk as uh, as perhaps the prize for us to try something different is always going to be there. And if you bring that to your business, and like for us, we attempted we attempted something that was basically impossible. It hasn't had it been done before, and we had nine weeks to achieve this big goal since I announced it and we actually put a day which was going to be Australia Day 2013 and it was the vision what motivated us effectively the impact that we wanted to achieve and the sense of accountability by making this public forces to then go and find the how so my answer perhaps is not to overthink it it's just commit to it and figure it out along the way because one way or another you're going to get there and yeah perhaps it's a very um, unreliable way but it has worked in a way for me and i have applied that to business and and, and business deals um yeah yeah i love that and, and we will actually talk about that in a minute too mm -hmm. about you know taking maybe a more unconventional way of doing business there is so much in there I, I wanted to quickly highlight two things one is i'm not sure if you have have read about this you probably have there, there are multiple studies around as you say we both grew up in the 80s in the 80s as kids we were allowed to roam depending on where you live but mostly we were allowed to roam go out come back at six o'clock for dinner and you're all good and and these days kids are not allowed to do that in most parts 
They're not allowed to do that because it's too dangerous, etc. So there has studies have been done. Is it more dangerous now? It is not. In fact, it is safer than ever before because we have tracking, you know, we can see where they are. There's there's so much more. When we were, you know, little, yeah. there was no tracking. They, they, they would never know where we were. We were allowed, you know, we weren't allowed to do mischief, but we did. And they would never know who we even did the mischief because they couldn't track us. Whereas yeah. now you can track. So it's it's a safer world, but we are more scared. And yeah. I find that really interesting because you also, the second point is you said that, you came from Chile and you actually had no fear of failure. And you say that Australia is a bit more conservative. I came from Switzerland and I, I didn't really have a fear of failure. However, I feel like Switzerland is even more conservative mm. than Australia. So do you think that Chile is even less conservative? Absolutely. Well, it, this is Chile back in the 80s. And I left at almost at the start of the 2000s. I, and I'm not sure if it happens to you, Francisca, but I sort of still my mind and my memories are sort of frozen to still think that Chile is the Chile that I left back in 2007. It has changed. It's very different to what it is, what it was then. Uh, it has certainly become a much more conservative in the way we raise children and similar to the, the way we do things in Australia. So, uh, but but certainly the 80s was, was, was different, as, as you said. You know, you disappeared in the morning, you come back at some point and your parents never worried because you knew they knew you were going to come back. Yeah, I actually think that builds resilience. And if we look at again Richard Branson and and his his background, and you've probably read all his books too. He he that's what he always said. He said his mom would even throw him out of the car mm. when he was naughty and say, "Walk home," <laughs> you know. And, yeah. And I find that really cool. We have a playground here nearby, and I try to to let my kids go. You know, go and and play and just come back. And every now and then, I send the dog and say, "Go go check on the." Hits and make sure they're cool and then you know she'll go have a look and come back so i feel like it's it actually helps build resilience as long as we create a safe environment and yeah. i'd love to talk about maybe we actually before we talk about intuition gut feeling let's talk a bit about resilience i feel like you have some insight here and i feel like as obviously as a business owner as an entrepreneur you need resilience yet the upcoming generations seem to have a little bit less resilience. So what what is, you can share anything on this topic, whatever your intuition tells you that you need to share here on this show, please feel free to share. Yes, I I, I, I do think that this is, uh, gen or what I can perceive, I don't have any more than just my observations, but I see that the newer generations are much more tooled up and there is an obsession to be perfect and ready before you do something. Um, and sometimes I think like, am I, or am I from a generation that is much more mediocre and we never attempted for things to be perfect so that we just went and tried things. Um, sometimes I think like the fear of failure then for us, it wasn't too bad because it was just probably going to be a handful of people that knew that you failed where now failure, it could be amplified in social media and all of those things that I'm 42 and I'm still trying to figure that out. So, uh, but in terms of resilience, and that's something that I, I, I have had time to think about because someone like myself, I lost both of my parents and as weird as it could sound, it helped me build my superpower, which is one of them, uh, resilience by going through this life event that most of us at some point will get to experience and unless you die before them. But it brings, uh, uh, I guess, a, a sense and a level of wisdom that often is much later in life. So for me, I, I try to use that experience to see what has given me and why at this time in my life it happened at my 30th and uh, and then with my dad when i was 12. so the resilience in in a generation wh where we are in a way over protecting them i thought can people become resilient uh, resilient outside being exposed to trauma and, and and that was something very difficult for me because I have two children and they're growing up in a very different way to the way I did. And I sometimes think uh, if I don't expose them to trauma, they might never be resilient. So I also feel that my, this, this is a very old fashioned 
thinking process the one I'm going through. So experimenting along the way, I discovered that perhaps one of those options is put kids into competitive sports and put them into something where they're going to uh, be exposed to rejection. They're going to be exposed to losing and having to deal with that and normalizing it. Um, and that, that's been something that uh, at least applying that to my 10 year old is being, it's been good. Um, but I do think that it's a, it's a significant bridge uh, in terms of communication and experiences in how I'm going to be able to relate to him when it comes to, to resilience. Yeah, it's a, it's a tough one because I mean, you know, parenting is, is mm. a journey too. And, and I think a lot of our listeners are also parents are interested in this topic. For, for me personally, it's, it's maybe not so much about thinking that they need trauma, but more about letting them fail. And make mm. almost like normalizing failure and little failures. My my daughter is only two and a half, but for her, little failures are, you know, I, I may watch her try and climb a tree, but I know that if she falls from that height, she's fine. So rather mm. than running and going like, no, you can't climb the tree. It's like, I know she's only going to this height. If she falls down, she will be all right. It's the sand underneath or, or, or you know, getting bumped by a wave and I'm nearby. I think rather than again, then, then constantly on them, and trying to avoid for them to fail in scenarios like that, mm. I think it's really important. And the other thing also I'm seeing with with kids is that they don't try hard enough. So even my two and a half year old, she you know, mm. she tries to open a zipper, and it mm. doesn't work. So the first time it doesn't work, she starts screaming. And so normally a parent would go and like, hey, I'll help you. So so I'm really trying to go, hey, let's you know keep trying it and rewarding her for her effort to mm. try. And then if it doesn't work after that, of course I will help. I'm not, you know, torturing her, but I feel like just not constantly stepping in, but actually letting them explore failure and and failure, as you say, almost celebrating failure. I I really like that. I love that we went down this path, even though we weren't intending on doing that. The the, the last thing I'd like to discuss here is something you talk a lot about, which is gut feeling versus strategy in business. And again, if we, you know, we have this overarching theme with Richard Branson, we started yeah. with challenging him with the paddle across the bay. He is someone who really does that so well, the gut feeling versus strategy. So I'd love to hear some of your thoughts on that and, and your your insights. Thank you. Um, yes, and I, I, funny, I, I don't actually think that this conversation isn't connected. In fact, I find it's very interesting when we look at the behavior of, as, as a business owner and how we uh, relate to our business and the things we do, a lot of it comes from those experiences in your upbringing and the limiting beliefs that you have adopted in your life in general. And and then when you start running a business, it's very clearly identifiable to, to get into similar way you relate in with people is you tend to relate to your customers, becoming very... Um, rejection uh, fearful and and then you start to build up a business that sometimes is sustainable in the way you're relating with those customers as a result of things that again has to do with your um, individual behavior um i thought I, answering that question I, I i give you an example because um i find this thing fascinating and i'm sure that you will be able to relate to this so think about uh, and according to the Australian Bureau of Statistics, 91% of businesses in 2023 financial year have revenues below 2 million bucks, right? And out of that, the average profit margin is 4%. So it's, it's a business, it's a really almost a multi-million dollar business, but really the profit is, is about 80 grand. So how we get to that most businesses, if you think about it, it started as a way to replace or complement your salary. And and this is a cycle that we get to see a lot. And both of us being in EO is very interesting because we probably discuss with people similar, having similar conversations all the time. And we get to this fork on the road, what do you do? So think about a marketing expert, you are in middle, man in middle management, you're earning maybe a hundred grand, let's say. And during the pandemic, you became 
uh, accustomed to the freedom that it was to go and pick up your children from school and work from home, etc. Now that we're returning back to the office, you want to now uh, buy your time. So you decided, I'm going to quit and I'm going to start my own business. So then you do that with intention to get to replace that 100 grand salary. You start a business, you take your first client, you are a marketing expert, so you easily go in and get your website and everything in order, get some leads, get a few clients, and then all of a sudden you are able to start making money. Next thing is those leads plus the work that you need to deliver is start to put pressure. So all of a sudden you find yourself in need to hire someone. So then that profit margin now is diluted among two people because you committed to hire someone. And as you continue to grow and now you continue to attend to those clients plus managing the business and managing that person, all of a sudden you get a larger client, let's say a 20K client that is now demanding more time and attention. So now you're committing to an admin person. But then all of a sudden you have this theme. But the money that comes to the business, all of a sudden, a lot of it goes to paying salaries. And that margin that was actually quite low, you find yourself in a situation where you start to miss your old life when at 5 p.m. you went home and you have nothing to worry about. You just show up the next day and you know when you're getting paid. But now you're earning less, you're taking more risks, you're working harder, and you think that, why am I doing this? Because you're not picking up your kids uh, from school anymore. So it's that moment when you decide, what am I going to do next? It's either I go back to my old life and I quit, or I need to grow significantly larger in order for this thing to start actually really offering me that lifestyle. So this is the moment where, if you at, at that very moment is when you can not continue operating by gut feeling. It's the moment that you, if you're going to grow, you do require to have a very clear vision and a very strong strategy that can be then executable. So it's one of those things that if you think about the great majority of businesses in Australia suffered the very similar problems. And that's why the number of new businesses entering the market and the number of businesses dying in the process is also almost equal. So we maintain this equilibrium based on the uh, number of businesses that die within the, the first three years, which is about 60%. So in in general, I guess the message is when you find yourself in this on, on this fork on the road when you have to either grow or quit, is when a strategy is required. Before that, many businesses have been operated on intuition. It never intended to be that big. They never intended to be employing people. But then that momentum is forcing you to start constantly reacting. So uh, in my opinion, there is a moment when the business can no longer sustainably grow uh, based on gut feeling, and it has to move into a strategy. Some people could argue that they have been able to do it uh, based on their own intuition. But when you talk to them and you dig deep into the things they did, you actually identify that there is a pattern, there is a strategy that they just haven't necessarily put that in writing or identified, but there is a very clear uh, systematic way of doing things. And it's a strategy. It's just they haven't necessarily verbalized that. Yeah, yeah, really, really uh, interesting thoughts there. And and I feel like there's sometimes a third way. So you say, you know, either grow or die. I actually also, we, we've seen a lot of small businesses over the, you know, 14, over how many years now? 14 years of running Basic Bananas. And I feel like there's, there's a third option, and that is to be super lean. I've seen a lot of businesses that are just not making any money because they're not lean enough. And sometimes you can you can definitely, I've actually seen, in fact, and this is interesting with entrepreneurs organization, I've seen bigger businesses that are not profitable at all. I've seen really small businesses that are super lean, that are way more profitable than the big businesses. So I do think there's a third way there. When it comes to, to strategy and God, I, I completely agree. I feel like, we we do need strategy to to grow and we we need strategy to to do different things you know having a sales strategy marketing strategy business strategy and then within that once we we've, we've got that foundation as you say we may make decisions that seem to be based on intuition 
And, mm. and that's what I'm observing too. And I think that's how you operate too. You have a really clear strategy and you help people get really clear on their strategy. And then within that, there are moments where we make some decisions based on intuition whether you know for, for me personally that would, could even be hiring someone and i know that an hr person mm. would say yeah. no way for me hiring someone has a lot of the times been based on you know some strategy but then very much intuition absolutely and, and, and that's the part when the business at the end of the day is a reflection of of you and the what i find is that it's almost like AI. You're able to come back into AI can learn the way you make those decisions that you call intuition, but they start to find a pattern. It's like you actually do follow a pattern that you haven't necessarily yet identified. And the beauty of the strategy at the end of the day is that helps you anticipate challenges and be prepared for them. You will go through challenges. But having a strong strategy, you know that those challenges will be manageable because you sort of were prepared financially or you know in, in, in resource wise, uh, right? And I'm giving you the opportunity to also uh, see and um, those opportunities. Without a strategy, I find we get distracted. We tend to divert our attention to other things. Um, and it's difficult sometimes to stay focused because there will be opportunities along the way that it could be also disguised into not necessarily being an opportunity it was just more a distraction and you took your, your focus away from where you were supposed to be going and doing into something that was shiny but at the end of the day it was simply a, a quick win that it wasn't really making any material um impact in, in your business yeah i agree i agree really really great distinctions there do you have any final wisdom any parting words that you would love to leave our audiences with uh, i would just like go, go to go back to what you said at the start of the conversation um francisca is invite more people today to just give it a go you know you have statistically more chances of failing so failing is actually what is likely to happen so forget about that self-judgment give it a go because in the process you're likely to find and personally that's where i believe uh, is my vehicle to for creating more impact is business i believe that i play at my best in business and i find my way to amplify what i'm my, my vision so i, I hope some people could be inspired out of this conversation that are contemplating starting a business, give it a go. Is 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 a beautiful life that you get to live as an entrepreneur. Yeah, I definitely walk away inspired today and, and just thinking more again about you know risk and and, and embracing failure. So mm -hmm. I definitely I, I feel like I walk away with that reminder again. If people want to connect with you, where can I find you? I know you have a website that is cesaraldea.com.au. We will post that in the show notes too would you also like to connect on linkedin or what are your favorite channels just linkedin and and uh the website those, those two are my i'm, I'm an old-fashioned i i only work on linkedin as my way to connect with the world and outside that is the website so reach out i'm always ready to have a conversation with anyone that wants to talk business or anything so right thank awesome. you it's, it's been great having this invitation today and and this is what happened every time we, we, we chat, Francisco. We, we can go here for hours. So Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, <laughs> I mean, yeah we, we could definitely continue talking for hours. I really appreciate you taking the time today. Thank you so much again for sharing your wisdom. I'm, I'm, really, I'm really excited to share this one with our audiences. For our audiences, thank you so much for tuning in as always. And if you love this show, please leave us a comment. And we do love the five-star reviews if you feel like you want to give us one. And thank you again. Thanks so much for joining us. To get more from Basic Bananas and to learn new ways to grow your business with clever marketing, visit basicbananas.com.